Podium mic. Right. Podium mic check. One, two, three. One, two, three. Uh, podium check, podium mic check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Audio mic check one two, audio check one two three four five. Podium audio check one two three four five, one two three four five.
All right, I'll give you a second. Well, good afternoon. Uh, for the last uh, month, it's been unfortunate uh, that many of our most vulnerable residents have had the anxiety uh, of not knowing whether their transportation is secure. Uh, but I am pleased today to announce uh, that DDOT's paratransit service will continue at full strength uh, into next year. Uh, the City of Detroit has just entered into emergency contracts with four more transportation providers. There will be full operations, uh, 1,000 rides a day, continuously uh, for the next six months, and that gives us time to put a permanent plan in place. Anybody that was concerned before, uh, this issue has been uh, resolved. Let me recap for you how uh, we got here. Uh, DDOT some years ago contracted out its whole uh, uh, dial-a-ride on-demand service, what we call paratransit, to a company called Transdev. Uh, and that contract provided that Transdev did the scheduling, sent out the buses, handled the customer service, etc. It put DDOT in a really bad position. When customers were unhappy, DDOT wasn't finding out about it. The calls were going to Transdev, which was operating the service. The complaints people had about poor paratransit service were absolutely correct. And I was extremely angry about it. Uh, and in January, directed DDOT to change the structure. It made no sense to put our customer service and scheduling in the hands of a private company. And so I directed DDOT to bring those services in-house. Uh, and uh, Michael Oglesby and Michael Staley are here. They have done it. They have hired a full staff of people. In fact, you're going to get a chance to meet them. Uh, but what is going to happen starting December 30th, when you call the number, you're going to talk to a DDOT employee who's going to schedule you, is going to dispatch the buses, and if you have any complaints with uh, rude drivers, late service, and the like, you'll be able to talk to DDOT staff. Uh, that was the first piece of it. Second, we said let's go ahead and contract with the buses themselves, the people that give you the rides, because we will be in a situation where if any one of the transportation providers is providing poor service, the DDOT staff will know immediately, we'll reduce the rides of that company, and we'll be able to terminate them. We won't need uh, to fool around. Any bad providers will be removed. Uh, DDOT followed that direction. Follow the city's procurement ordinance went out for bid. We got four responsive bidders. One, People's Express, which city council approved, and three others uh, that city council uh, did not approve. And we ended up in a, a situation, unfortunately, where I think there was a lot of misinformation. Uh, there was anger out there at Transdev under the old system. It was justified. But under the new system, Transdev wasn't going to do the scheduling. Transdev wasn't going to do the customer service. Transdev wasn't going to bring you the buses. They had a peripheral support service for insurance and a couple other things uh, for the people we were contracting with. Uh, but uh, this has been, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to explain this. Uh, uh, but on November 17th, the federal government was extremely concerned about what they were seeing, and they sent a letter to the mayor and the council saying, if you do not approve this, you are in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You're subject to Justice Department investigation and oversight. You're subject to the freezing of the uh, bus service, all the bus money for the city of Detroit. And it never occurred to me that there would be uh, any question. But uh, you saw what happened two weeks ago Tuesday. Council on a 4-4 vote failed to uh, approve it. Uh, and then recessed until after next year, guaranteeing that there would be no bus service for 700 people a day. The federal government uh, reacted exactly as you would expect, uh, sent another letter and made it very clear the Justice Department was going to be in here very quickly. Uh, we were going to be back into consent order situations 
uh, and the like. Fortunately, the city procurement ordinance has an emergency provision that allows uh, the Office of Procurement to act without council approval when public exigencies require the immediate delivery of services. And so I made the determination that this is clearly a case where public exigencies require the immediate delivery of transportation service. Uh, and Sandra Stahl uh, and the Office of Procurement, working with Hassan Beydoun, our legal counsel, uh, Michael Oglesby and Michael uh, Staley from DDOT, did a remarkable thing. The original bid process took six months. In two weeks, they set up a new system, lined up four providers, negotiated agreements, and today we have signed agreements with four new contractors, Mo Transportation, Big Star Transit, Checker Cab, and Delray United, in addition to the People's Express contract that City Council previously approved. We had to do a different structure. Uh, because of the emergency nature, uh, and we are just going to pay these companies $67 an hour to run the service. Uh, and we're going to do this for the next six months. So if the original contract had been approved, the six months would have cost us $4.7 million. At this emergency rate, it's going to cost us $5.8 million. It's going to be a million dollars more. Uh, I felt that the security uh, of our disabled community was worth it. Uh, the legal fees from fighting the Justice Department would have been well more than a million dollars. Uh, and so uh, we now have a contract uh, in place. So here is what is going to happen. You are still going to dial the same phone number. It's going to be seamless from our client's standpoint. 313-208-7363. We worked it out uh, with AT&T and Transdev uh, that that phone number will ring at DDOT. DDOT staff will answer the phone. We'll give you a chance to go and meet them. I think you're going to find a group of employees uh, who uh, Michael Staley has been training uh, and are ready to uh, take over in the next couple weeks. Uh, but they are people who want to help you get where you need to get uh, with as positive an experience as possible. I'm really pleased that we're bringing it in-house. There may be a few weeks of learning curve. Uh, but uh, when, you answer, when you call, you will get booked in your appointment. They will dispatch one of the five companies. Every week, there will be a performance report on each of the five companies, on on-time performance, on any customer satisfaction issues. We will have those report cards out to those companies. If any of the companies operates in a substandard way, we will give them a brief period of time to improve it. Uh, and if they don't improve it, we'll move their rides to the companies who are delivering service. This puts DDOT in charge uh, of the quality of the service. And I'm very confident as we get into February, March, April, that we're gonna get a chance to hear from one of the writers who just told me her stories. I, I, don't, uh, I don't have any excuse for the poor performance you've gotten in the past. We are completely changing the system, so we're taking responsibility at DDOT for the quality of your paratransit rides uh, in the future. These contracts are in place for six months, uh, and in January, Sandra Stahl and the Procurement Department uh, will start another uh, uh, bidding process to give us a chance to put a permanent system in place, uh, which uh, I've talked to most of the council members now. Uh, a number of them uh, you know, have, have asked me to acknowledge this, and I, and I should have acknowledged this, but we had a number of council people who did the right thing. James Tate, uh, Mary Sheffield, Coleman Young, uh, and Fred Durhall. Uh, uh, understood the importance of not violating federal law. And Scott Benson was out sick. He would have done it as well. And so uh, I want to thank those council members uh, who attempted to do the right thing. After the conversations I've had over the last couple of days, I'm confident that council is going to act to make sure not to run afoul of federal law in the future. But in the meantime, uh, this problem is resolved. Contracts are in place, and with that, I'll turn it over to the man uh, running the system, Michael Oglesby. Thank you, sir. Well, how do I follow that? Uh, it's a great day today. I'm very excited. We finally have the tools to do our job. So first thing I want to do uh, is thank the mayor to make sure that the service continues. Without him, we would probably be talking to you about 30 percent service January 1st. Uh, but that is no longer, so that is off the table. Our, our job is to provide service to the riders. 
Uh, and we made a promise uh, some time ago that we were going to not only change the format that paratransit was set up with currently, but we're also going to enhance the rider's experience. I stand behind it, and I will tell you that service will get better. There's one thing I can guarantee that you'll notice uh, uh, January 1st is that customer service, just that portion, will instantly get better the second you flip the switch. And you're going to see why once we um, go down, uh, if you'd like, and talk to some of them. So we started this plan a year ago. We knew which way we wanted to go. We, were, we, we followed the process, we respected the process, and we got to a point where we were at a standstill. Again, like I said, uh, the mayor stepped in and, um, and made it happen. Uh, I can assure the Federal Transportation Administration that service will continue. And we pro pro promised uh, uh, reliability is going to be better, um, there'll be immediate impact, like I said, in customer service. Uh, it's going to be a little bumpy at first because of the way that we're transitioning, but we will have full service out there, and that's the most important thing. Uh, after six months, I'm excited that once the RFP results are in and we move forward with what we're going to do with the remaining 70% on a long-term basis, we will continue to enhance. We will continue to look for other ways to provide better transportation. We're going to look at every option that's out there to provide a premier experience that Detroit has not seen. And I stand behind it. With that, I brought on board a person who can assist in doing this. As a matter of fact, he's done a few startups and he's been doing this for, oh, about, I won't date you, 36 years. Um, so uh, uh, Mr. Staley is, has come in with the exact same energy that we have and excitement. And I'm going to bring him up now, and he can talk about whatever he wants from the key performance indicators, uh, whatever you'd like. So Michael, please come up. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Mayor Duggan and Mr. Oglesby. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude for today's announcement and the associated actions that will allow DDOT Paratransit uh, to provide full service to its customers uh, beginning on January 1st, 2023 and uh, going forward after that. Anyone who's uh, paid attention to the recent developments uh, regarding paratransit is acutely aware of the fact that the new service model uh, that was designed by the city through DDOT uh, has a remarkably robust quality assurance process much more so than the one that's in place today. DDOT employees will gather operating data every day and compile it into a weekly report um, by service provider, as the, uh, as the mayor indicated. Um, we've identified key performance indicators in the areas of safety, uh, service reliability, customer service, and productivity. Uh, a muscular, QA process working in concert with DDOT employees who will be performing the critical functions of reservation taking, scheduling, and dispatching, as well as administering the customer complaint process from intake through investigation to resolution. We'll put all the elements in place that will allow uh, DDOT paratransit not only to comply fully with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, but also meet and exceed the expectations uh, of our customers. These are the things, uh, all of these elements, these are the things that we heard from our customers um, that they expect and they deserve. Uh, finally, if I can, on a, on a personal note, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be associated with the transformation of paratransit in the city of Detroit. Um, and I am very well aware of many of the challenges um, that we have to face. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Steinberger from Goodwill Industries. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ed Steinberger, and I'm the director of the Detroit Career Center for Goodwill Industries of Greater Detroit. And um, in that capacity, we are working with um, Goodwill programming in our behavior and mental health um, programming is about 150 roughly people a day, about 350 to 400 people per year. 
90% of whom use paratransit to get to and from programming, to get to and from their jobs, to be independent folks just like everybody else. And when we heard that paratransit was going to be cut, it, um, it, was, there was, it was devastating throughout all of the services, not just Goodwill, but all the other human service agencies throughout the city of Detroit whose um, participants rely on this vital service on a daily basis. Um, people are using paratransit to get, like I say, to work, to different kinds of programming, to health care and mental health appointments. Um, they're using it to socialize and to meet with their families, to do shopping. Um, and this, to not have that in place for them would just be tragic for the most vulnerable population in the city of Detroit. So um, I really want to thank the mayor and the mayor's office and his staff for putting in place this, this emergency operation. Um, I'm, I really didn't know anything about how this was gonna work until today. So all the things that I'm hearing um, sound really wonderful because the service before did have um, a lot of issues. And so we're looking forward to how the service is going to be going forward. And with that, I'm gonna introduce you to um, Tatiana Floyd, who is an employee at Goodwill, who has gone through Goodwill programming and who um, is qualified to and uses paratransit every day to get to and from work and to do other things in her life and helps her to be in the independent person that she is. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tatiana Floyd. I work at Goodwill as a DG Savage Operator. DG Savage Operator is responsible for taking pictures of items and posting them in our website, shopgoodwill.com, and having the items being processed in the Ecormis department. I have been working at Goodwill for a year, going on two years. I use paratransit every day to get to work and back home, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. I also use the program to get my hair done, visit my mom, go to my doctor's appointments, and necessity shop. I depend on paratransit because that is the only transportation that I have. If people were to cut transport, if people were to cut par paratransit services, some people would have to take the bus, and some people don't know how to catch the bus. My life would change dramatically because I would not be able to work, attend my doctor's appointments, and attend my hair appointments. In conclusion, I would like to thank Mayor Duggan and DDOT for working so hard to make sure that myself and others that use the program will not be left without the service in 2023. Thank you. So uh, Detroiters, uh, like Tatiana, deserve to know the bus is going to show up on time. The driver is going to be polite, going to transport her safely to where she's going and get her back on time. That's what our residents deserve, and that's what we're going to move toward in this new system. But with that, uh, we'll take any questions. Go ahead. They, they had it. The letter was sent November 17th. They had it and we had it November 17th. Whether they discuss, I, I didn't watch the meetings, but it was received ahead of the November 22nd vote. And, and Director, you know, was that something that you communicated to them you know, very clearly? Because some council members and their staff just didn't see that letter. They received the letter, and if you uh, look very closely at the discussion, even one of the, board, one of the members says, I'm aware of the documents received, and I'm still voting it down. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah, this, uh, was, this wasn't a surprise. Mayor, you were upset, sounds like, with Transdev's uh, service at the beginning of your bids and the complaints that you were hearing about. Um, I understand there were a few bids that were received in this process. I know it's been talked about a lot in these meetings. But can you tell us again, you know, why were they ultimately chosen for the contract yeah. that was rejected? Because I, I think the arrangement that we have now working directly with these subcontractors that were, aside from Checker Cab, we're going to work with Transdev. It's kind of yeah. similar to an arrangement that some on the council had wanted, those who specifically yeah. voted against the Transdev contract. So the city of Detroit is obligated to follow the procurement ordinance adopted by city council. Uh, and we went out for transportation providers. We did not know who we were going to get. These folks could have all bid the first time. Uh, we didn't tell people who to bid, but when it was done, there were four responsive bidders, uh, and all four were sent to city council. And so uh, we had an obligation to follow the bid process. We lost a couple months as council debated it back and forth before they uh, finally turned it down. But um, uh, we could have rebid, and we may well rebid, uh, but people could have chosen that. They didn't. But here's your, your, your situation. Uh, you can't, after the bid's done, just say, oh, let's change some terms. Under the procurement ordinance, you can't do that. We were bound to the responsive bidders that we had. Uh, we submitted them. Transdev was not going to have a material role in delivering the, uh, the service. Uh, but in any event, uh, we've got the contracts now. Uh, and I'm confident we'll execute them competently. Yes? Yeah, Bruce, the, yourself and the director have alluded to the fact that starting uh, January 1, things are going to change. We've got some time until then. What do you want to say to Detroiters about how services are going to get reliability, accountability? How are you going to bend that gap between now and the first? So I hope you will go into the next room when you're done here and talk to uh, the new employees uh, because they are Detroiters working for Detroit. Uh, who are going to be doing the scheduling, doing the customer service, and assuring the quality performance uh, from the contractors. Uh, and so the original DDOT structure was bad. Transdev should not have been supervising themselves. It was a flawed structure. Everything that you've heard about the complaints of the service is true. Tatiana gave me an earful uh, earlier uh, today. Uh, it was a structure that should not have happened, and that's why we changed it. So now DDOT is supervising the uh, uh, providers, and DDOT is doing the quality assurance, and that's why I believe you're going to see it get better. We, we can make changes here if there's a problem, but uh, this is the right structure to have quality control and customer service under the hands of DDOT. You're asking a question I've been asking myself for, for a while, and I, this after or this morning I met with the entire DDOT staff because in two weeks with the entire city team behind this, we came up with a solution that I think is good. I'm not happy with our regular DDOT service. It is not up to a good standard. And so I met with the uh, DDOT management team today. I'm going to sit with them every two weeks. And we need to see if we can do the same thing with our large buses. We need a lot more bus service on the street. Uh, some of you may know I ran the smart bus service in the 90s. I know what it means to run a quality bus system. Uh, and I am going to be much more personally engaged uh, at DDOT in 2023 because we need to raise the performance of that whole system. Right. alluded to before. Um, six months from now, we're going to be talking about a permanent solution. Do you feel, can you pledge today that a trans-dev contract will okay. come across the table? Because I think that, I think regardless of these, these, uh, these changes that are kind of coming down the pipeline, working with this company is like a non-starter for many riders. You know, I think at some point facts matter. Uh, and I know it doesn't always in politics, but uh, with what we had done, 
we had taken Transdev out of the scheduling dispatch customer service role, which was causing 95% of the problems. Uh, but I do not have a right to say to companies, you can't submit a bid. Uh, and so I don't know who's going to bid. One of the criteria of the bid is going to be delivering bus service. But again, I would point out, Transdev was never going to operate the buses. They were providing peripheral services to the bus operators. My guess is after six months of these operators dealing directly with us, I, I can't predict who they will, will bid with, but I can tell you the city of Detroit is going to honor the procurement ordinance, and people are entitled to bid. Uh, people will be evaluated when the bids come in, uh, and we'll have a, a long-term answer. My, my guess is this week Transdev is not really inclined uh, to have much to do with the, the city of Detroit. I am appreciative that they consented to transferring the telephone number over so that our customers uh, can continue the same phone number, which they didn't have to do and they've done uh, in the last week. So they're cooperating with us on this transition, but Transdev is going to be fully out of this operation uh, December 31st. Okay, so Chucker Cab is currently providing transportation on the current format. Uh, when we bring them in, it's going to be at a, a much smaller scale, almost like a filler, if you will. Um, so, uh, yes, we're going to be directly involved, and Mr. Staley could even get into this more, but we're go it's going to be better service because we're overseeing them. We're managing them. We are training them. We're going to make sure that they're providing good service. And as the mayor said earlier, if they're not, then we take the rides from them and they give it to the other three. That's why we have four. Consequently, has uh, the emergency truck dumping um, capability been used? And is, is there anything you, know, you, you would say about the, the fact that you are using it now? What I say, Andrew, two, three times a year? Very sparingly. Yeah. Yeah, I would say probably two, three times a year this comes up. Normally it comes up, again, you have a six or seven week city council recess and the business of government goes on. So, um, but I would say probably two, three times a year is my guess. Somebody in procurement could probably look it up for you. But it's not a common uh, way of doing things. Was that emergency process, uh, you know, essential in speeding up getting this contract approved within two weeks? Or, or I guess I'm, I'm interested in what exactly was done to get this across the table? given that the last time it was six months, we were concerned about how quickly another yeah. deal could be struck and why council doesn't get approval on that. Well, council, uh, council's not in to get approval, and uh, we have to have service up and running uh, January 1, but uh, I don't know how to describe it to you. They've been, the group has been gathered in my office uh, two and three times a day. Uh, we reached out to multiple providers. Uh, we proposed different arrangements. Uh, and uh, uh, we're really lucky to have Michael Staley, who's run a lot of this stuff, uh, but it was his idea, why don't we just pay him per hour? Uh, and our goal was, can we get signed contracts for 1,000 rides a day to go seamlessly by January 1st? And so uh, between Sandra Stone Procurement, they talked to multiple companies, who, could, who had enough vehicles, who had enough drivers. There was no way in the world, I'm going to have to answer to Dawn Eisen, our U.S. Attorney this afternoon, there was no way in the world I was telling the U.S. Attorney we were going to be below 1,000 rides uh, January 1st. And so uh, Michael and the team, and the procurement team, negotiated it. Uh, they texted me every time they got ink on a page from the next contractor. Uh, last night they texted me that they had ink on the page for the fourth contractor, which is what we had went ahead and scheduled this is when we had signed contract. It is amazing what Sandra and Michael and the team did uh, around the clock in, uh, in two weeks. And I have to say the providers, can you imagine? We got them on the phone and said, here's what we're thinking. How many buses do you have? How many drivers do you have? What can you have up and running January 1? Some of them said, if you give us till March. I said, no, no, <laughs> we, we don't have till March. Uh, and so uh, I'm just really proud uh, of the way the city team I did this. I would not have believed we could pull this off in two weeks. Just as a follow-up, is that you talked to the council president about 
yeah. whether they could schedule a special session, because it sounded like they were interested in doing that. Why not give them the opportunity? To Again, an emergency contract means you don't go through the normal bid process. So the emergency contract does not require uh, council approval. So there was no reason uh, to have uh, that uh, discussion. Uh, there may be another issue where council schedule session next week uh, where we're back to working together. But on this one, we, I wanted the Justice Department not in here, and we did what we had to do to keep, keep them satisfied. Yes? Can, can I say uh, something real quick? Here, my client. Uh, Michael. Uh, I would just add three elements. Uh, no sleep, 14-hour days, and something I've never experienced in the 10 transitions I've done before. Uh, text messages on almost an hourly basis from the uh, mayor of a major American city. <laughs> the text messages are better than the phone calls. <laughs> so, go, go ahead, Sarah, you had a question. Uh, so, let's say we're in the same city and somebody is going to the party. One, we, 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 we won't be. Okay. Um, can I ask what portion of federal funding would that take here if we do that budget? What I, uh, I don't know. What do they give us? $100 million a year? It's a huge yeah. number. Yeah, they, they, they do. They, they never gave us a specific threat, but they have enough that they didn't really need to. So, yes? I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, the, I think DDOT, I, I ran SMART for four years. SMART runs one of the best paratransit operations in America. They have to because they have so few main lines that the seniors and, and handicap really rely on SMART's paratransit service. I've always been surprised that DDOT has not placed uh, the same priority in the management of paratransit service. But I can tell you that's about to change. I don't have any excuse for it before, uh, but I know what first class paratransit service looks like. Michael Staley knows what first class paratransit service looks like. And we are going to have first class paratransit service in the city of Detroit going forward. We're going to evaluate that. As I said, when I was at SMART, we ran the whole thing in-house. Our, our drivers uh, of our buses were SMART employees. It's one model. Uh, it's possible you could have a blended model. There's one more thing I'd like to see, and I know that this is going to be a high priority uh, for Mr. Staley, is I don't know why you got to call 24 hours ahead of time. Uh, I'd like to have a same-day option. Uh, so, Tatiana, how would that be, to have a same-day option to make a schedule? Right? Uh, and so I'm hoping in the next 6 to 12 months uh, that Michael's going to have a same-day option. We're already talking about that. So you're going to see uh, th there was no reason that we had to have this dispute. Th this thing was on a curve uh, to be done a lot better. But um, uh, we're going to be judged on how we do going forward. Uh, and I think you're going to see in six months not just an enhancement of the uh, current system, but if you're not familiar with it today, you have to make your appointment 24 hours to 14 days ahead of time. Uh, if something happens that day, you need to go to the doctor. Uh, DDOT uh, paratransit is not available to you. I'd love to see uh, a same-day option for our clients, and I'm confident we're going to get to that uh, in the future. Anything else? All right, Michael, you want to talk about what we're going to do next? Um, downstairs, uh, we have our uh, first class of new hires for the uh, DDOT Paratransit Call Center, and they've been in training. This is their third week of training. Um, they will continue to train uh, until we begin to take phone calls on the uh, 30th of December at 8 o'clock in the morning. So uh, they're in training right now. They're, they probably are looking at, we had Ecolane, which is the uh, scheduling software company was in last week doing real uh, intensive on-site training. Um, they left us with some training videos from their time on-site, and uh, they're probably downstairs right now looking at uh, reviewing one of those uh, training vehicles, or one of those training videos. All right, so everybody would like to go with Michael and talk to the folks are welcome, and uh, thank you all for being here.